Cars that feel at home off-road continue to grow in popularity. Now BMW has added a new model to its fleet of sports utility vehicles. The X1 is the smallest member of BMW's X family, but it's more than just a shrunk down version of its bigger siblings. From the front, the X1 presents the upright posture of an SUV, while the sloping rear is almost like a coupe. BMW's Peter Chris says the X1 was conceived to fill out the lower end of the X family of SUVs. BMW has established a premium segment in each of its classes, with the X5, then the X3, and now with the X1. Chris says the X1 was developed independently as a new interpretation of an X car in this class. It was developed quickly in less than three years. The X1 presents a distinctive steep front end. The car is 12 centimeters lower and 12 centimeters shorter than the X3, even though both are built on the BMW 3 Series platform. The shapely contours along the car's sides create a flashy interplay of light and shadow. And as one would expect from a BMW, the X1 is fun to drive but we wanted to know whether the small SUV would do as well as its bigger brothers off-road. Naturally, you can get the X1 with permanent all-wheel drive, but BMW has added a new twist. The X1 is the first BMW off-roader available with rear-wheel drive only. BMW calls the feature S-Drive and delivers it with a manual six-speed gearbox as standard equipment. Peter Kust explains that S-Drive is something new for BMW. It's a vehicle for customers who don't necessarily need all-wheel drive but still want to enjoy the advantages of this kind of car. Plus, Chris says, S-Drive makes it possible to combine driving dynamics with fuel efficiency. The 18D model consumes just 5.2 liters of diesel per 100 kilometers and emits just 136 grams of carbon dioxide. Verbrauch von nur 5,2 Litern, respektive 136 Gramm CO2-Ausstoß. The X1 is available with a gasoline engine or one of three diesel power plants. Our test car was a 177 horsepower, 2 liter diesel that burns 5.8 liters per 100 kilometers. It charges from 0 to 100 in just 8.4 seconds. To make it even more efficient, BMW has equipped the X1 with automatic start-stop, shifting cues, and regenerative braking to capture energy when slowing the car down. The interior is furnished with the attention to detail that one expects from BMW. Everything is clear and orderly. The seats provide excellent support, even in rough terrain. The rear seat can be folded down in one, two, or three sections and can be reclined to several positions. It's been 10 years since BMW started building its X family of cars. First came the X5, launched in 1999. It was followed by the X3 and then the X6 in 2009. The X1 is built at BMW's Leipzig factory, which also produces the 1 Series Coupe and Cabrio and the 3 Series sedan. In Germany, prices for the newest X car start at 29,950 euros. Fiat has introduced a new version of its unconventional Cubo. The Cubo trekking is equipped for off-road conditions with aluminum style protective panels, a prominent roof rail, and tinted rear windows. The trekking also comes with Traction Plus electronic traction control, which keeps the car sure-footed even on slippery or uneven surfaces. Prices for the trekking start at 16,990 euros in Germany. 
Peugeot has unveiled the BB1, the French car maker's vision of an electric car. The concept vehicle is just two and a half meters long and weighs 600 kilos. With electric motors in the rear wheels and lithium ion batteries, the car has a range of up to 120 kilometers and seats four occupants. Peugeot is now sending the BB1 on a European tour with stops in Paris, London, Madrid, and Milan to see how the public reacts. They are very small and very nimble. You'd think the Smart 4.2 and the Toyota IQ would be perfect for short trips in the city. But do these two minis deliver what they promise? In length, 299 centimeters for the IQ compared to 270 for the Smart. The IQ is 168 centimeters wide, the Smart just 156. The IQ is 150 tall, the Smart 154. That makes the IQ considerably larger, but it's still a very small car. Our test driver Matas Kurat says with dimensions like that, one can't expect much trunk space. The Smart has only two seats, which leaves a little space in the back. In the IQ, the back seats are almost flush with the rear hatch. But when the back seats are folded down, there is quite a bit of space for luggage. Here are the numbers. The IQ will hold between 32 and 238 liters of gear, depending on how the seats are folded. The Smart will take 220 liters or 340 if it's piled to the roof. Next up, Matas takes a look at the inside of the Smart. He says the interior, and especially the color combinations, are matched to the Smart's exterior look. The fabric seat covers in red and black match the red materials on the dashboard and the black fittings. And Mata says there are lots of fun touches, like the distinctive gauges under the windshield, aimed at attracting a younger, more playful crowd. The Toyota, on the other hand, is more conventional. Mata says the interior of the IQ seems tidier and more grown up than in the Smart. It looks well put together with attractive materials. The seats are comfortable with leather and fabric in brown and black. One thing that bothers Matis is the large center console, which takes up lots of space but serves no apparent purpose. Squeezed into the back, Mata says he has a hard time believing Toyota's claims the car will comfortably seat three adults who are one meter ninety tall. Even for him, there is no headspace and no leg room, which makes Matas conclude the back seat is suitable for only children. For locomotion, the Toyota offers a diesel and two gasoline engines for the IQ, ranging from 68 to 98 horsepower. Our test vehicle has the smallest engine, a one liter unit. The factory promises fuel consumption of 4.7 liters per 100 kilometers, but our car with the continuously variable automatic transmission needed considerably more. Mata says he has to admit the IQ drives quite well, but just like with the Smart, the gearbox takes some getting used to, even though it's completely different. It's a continuously variable transmission that lets the engine reach high revs during acceleration, and it shifts without interrupting the power, which is very nice. So how does the Smart compare? Mata says the Smart handles well, but he doesn't like the semi-automatic gearbox because it takes forever to change gears. There's a button on the gear shift that allows you to select automatic or manual shifting, and then you can shift with paddles on the steering wheel. But even then, it's not very sporty. It's supposed to feel that way, but the slow gear changes just aren't right. <laughs> 
welchen Anschein vermitteln, aber durch die langen Schaltpausen ist es einfach nicht schön. The Smart is available with four different gasoline engines and one diesel, ranging from 61 to 98 horsepower. We tested a one liter gasoline engine equipped with a micro hybrid drive. Das heißt, Matas tells us what that means. It's nothing more than a motor equipped with a start stop automatic that turns the engine off when it comes to a stop. The bottom line for us is that both cars do not offer a great deal of utility for the price. There are other cars that offer more for considerably less money. But for drivers who put a premium on compactness, these cars will fit the bill.